How you doing folks? My name is Chris Gambit, Editor-in-Chief of The Footblogger, and today we're doing something a little bit different. You probably haven't seen my face in a while because I'm just taking a break and letting Dan more or less lead the YouTube channel and the audio and all that kind of stuff. But we're doing something a little bit different today. Uh, Space for Arts uh, wanted to do a collaboration with Footblogger where they interview me. Um, you know, Footblogger is in its 13th year now. So I figured, okay, cool, let's do something a little bit different. Let's, uh, let's let you folks publish a written interview on your website, and I will publish uh, the video and or the audio feed on Fablogger's, uh whatever. So I'm joined here by Megan uh, from Space for Arts and Focus on Women. Hey, hey I'm good. How are you this morning? I am wonderful today. Uh, things are going well. Not gonna lie, I hate being on camera. Always have. Same. But uh, yeah. I mean, things are well. Um, I I purposely chose this color because I, for anyone that can't see this, um, I'm wearing the color saffron, mm -hmm. and it's because I'm so excited about this one ice cream that I've been having recently. I know how nerdy that sounds, but um, I'm really into saffron ice cream now. I was introduced to it from a Facebook group that uh, I'm part of. So um, I'm just literally all about saffron right now, maybe a little bit too much. So. Saffron ice cream. I feel like that might be an unattainable goal for me. I live in Western Maryland uh, where I probably would not be able to find saffron ice cream, but it's intriguing. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you'll probably be able to find it. I mean, it's this brand called Heritage Kulfi and I love them. It, they're an Indian ice cream brand, mm -hmm. so they'll be spreading around. Um, hopefully it'll come to Maryland soon. But we'll see. We're here to talk about uh, photography and photographer and all that other stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm representing Space for Arts, and um, they are a website, an organization that matches up photographers with studio space in large cities, um, helping you guys find your, you know, perfect shooting location. Um, and it's it's been interesting. I'm new to the organization as a writer, and um, it's been interesting getting to know that side of a world I'm not privy to um, as a writer uh, living in rural Maryland, you know, not being associated with photography at all. It was really interesting to me to see that um, such an organization exists. Uh, and also it's, it's a collaboration with Focus on Women um, to elevate the voice of female and female identifying photographers in the photography spaces. Um, so I'm really happy that you agreed to meet with us and give us um, some information about you and your photography work um, and your advocacy, not only for female and female identifying um, people, but for um, various identity groups. Um, I looked at your LinkedIn and your blog, and um, it seems like you've long been a champion for those communities. Um, and I'm really curious, you know, just as the starting off point, um, just to go back to the photography first, you know, um, how did you? What what was the pathway for you to photography, specifically? There there are a couple different pathways. Um, it started out, I guess, really as a hobby. Um, when I got like those old flip phones, you remember those the little Nokia's? Yeah. Um, and I went on uh my first solo vacation when. I was in my late teens. Um, I remember taking a lot of photos and falling in love with the whole process. But then um, when I was going into college, I went into journalism. Uh, I have a journalism degree. And I decided I would experiment with all different types, um, photo, video, uh, even writing, obviously. And my mentor, John Williams, a uh, Pulitzer winner for the New York Newsday, and he would rip apart our work, like, ruthlessly. Mm. And I thought to myself, I need to find a way to actually really pass this class. So I tried various different ways and finally ended up passing the class. But you know that analogy that, like, sometimes you feel like you need to swim to keep your head above water. And then when you're okay, you just kind of have to swim harder. Yep. That's how I felt back in college in that class. And when the class was over and I passed, I, I don't want to say that there was this void in me, um, but there was this point where I was like, you know, I'd really been focusing so much on photography 
I just want to keep doing it. So I'm just going to keep doing mm. it. So I got into photojournalism too. And um, during that time, uh, I was mostly more of a video guy, but when I graduated college, still paid the bills, so mm. to speak. So um, photography just stuck with me. And so uh, was it natural for you to find your way into spaces or um, how do I want to frame this question? I guess, you know, asking what I'm asking is, how did you find your way into sort of honing your advocacy for different identity groups and, you know, marginalized communities? Um, part of that comes from my own personal experiences and I guess confusion from when I was younger. I grew up in a Hindu home mm. and I went to Catholic school because it was just like the best school around there. I grew up in South Ozone Park, Queens. Um, Queens is arguably the most diverse place in America and probably the world. And, you know, I remember there being a lot of like casual racism just thrown my way and then like just joking racism. Like, you probably remember Tom Green on MTV mm, yeah. from so many different years yeah. ago and like all the different things he would throw at Indians. And then my friends would watch those and they would tell me all those things. And I was just like, yeah. but I I'm not like that. Like I'm totally different. So I cared a lot about representation and about equality. But then in addition to that too, like, Growing up in Hindu home and then going to a Catholic school, I was always confused. So I was just like, you know, I'm going to be ex as experimental and as open as I possibly can. And that's permeated through me. I mean, I turned 35 like last week and I I'm still that kind of person. I'm just open and experimental and I embrace everyone. Um, I uh, really try to internalize and understand things before I make any sort of decision. Mm. And... Then when I got into the career world, um, in the tech photo world and even the art photo world, I started to see the same patterns. Uh, as an entrepreneur, like you just have to like knock on doors in order to actually make things work, especially when you start a site or a publication or something like that. And I started to notice that certain folks would be more receptive and certain folks would not. And the receptive folks, uh, some of them cared about symbiotic relationships and some of them cared about uh, more or less just trying to use people however they mm. could. And um, I really cared about trying to find a way to treat people the best I could. Um, and, and it's kind of sad because you look at some of the most successful people like Elon Musk and like Bezos and all those people and they got to where they were by stepping on people. I don't really believe in stepping on people. I believe in trying to find ways to uplift one another in symbiotic ways. Um, and also just in creating a balance, you know? Like, I don't really necessarily feel that there is a balance for uh, specifically South Asians in the art world versus necessarily other types of Asians and other types of groups. But also, I mean, we it's been a big problem since like 2019 that, well, forever, I'm sorry. But 2019 is really, really when we started to, and when I say we, I mean the community in general, has really started to uh, be more vocal about equality and authenticity and all that kind of stuff. So... <clears throat> I guess that's more of a longer answer to your question. I hope I answered it. No, I think um, it was really insightful. And a couple of things that came to mind while you were talking, um, I grew up on Long Island and had family in Queens. Um, and I just, it really resonates with me what you were saying about casual racism, especially in, you know, the 70s, 80s, you know, early 90s in that geographic area anyway, and I'm sure the nation uh, at large. Um, but I guess... I mean, this is an assumption on my part, but did you feel like even though you were split between, you know, a Hindu home and a Catholic school, it sounds like you had this space maybe within your family unit or your community, uh, whatever you were defining community as in your teens, um, to be that person who, you know, jumped from thing to thing, who experimented and who, you know, sort of, um, for lack of a better cliche, you know, beat your own drum. <laughs> um, 
And do you think that 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 shaped you? I mean, having this, the permission, I guess, permission is a terrible word, but you know what I'm getting at, right? (laughs) I completely understand what you're getting at. You had a safe Um, space to sort of explore who you were, even though your identity in some ways was, you know, divided or your, your understanding of yourself was somewhat divided by these two um, situations you were in. I had to make my own safe space. Mm. Um, I guess that's partially where I say where uh, I was talking about knocking on doors. That came even before I started being an entrepreneur. Um, I had to talk to people. I had to find different ways to make things work. Um, I have this analogy because uh, I've gotten it in various meditations. I've been meditating for like 16 years. Um, usually try to do once a day. Sometimes I'll do twice a day. It's the idea that like there's this sea of darkness, right? And you are a light. You have a torch and you need to find a way a torch with fire that is and you need to find a way to spread the light to other different ways but you it's very hard to so you have to go through you have to navigate in the darkness and you just have to like find these other like brambles to bring light to and eventually what happens is you're able to just go and define your own path because you lit all these different paths Mm -hmm. up Um, And that's how it was with different friend groups and different circles. Um, Even kind of right now, I mean, I have friend group, I have friends in the photo world, in the food world, in the tech world, um, in the yoga and Pilates community, and then just people that I've known for so many different years. So uh, to answer your question, I really just had to like knock on doors and create my own space within those certain communities i mean obviously i'm not like necessarily always accepted as a person but that could probably be a personality thing like some people hate the queen's accent some people you know i don't know know, joke (laughs) yeah yeah um i was thinking too when you were talking before about um you know that you mentioned 2019 you know and that there's a, a wider awareness now um of the, the ways we push groups to the margins and, and trying to bring those groups back to center and decenter a lot of, you know, what we, I think we sometimes label it under that umbrella of the American dream, right? But the American dream is centered on white, <laughs> cisgender, heterosexual men. And so, you know, trying to decenter that and, and push out and then bring in, um, I'm teaching a lesson this week at the college course that I teach about inclusive language. And you know, part of what I'm working on with these students is understanding that, you know, their word choices matter. And, you know, if they're going into a workplace where the standard is, you know, the business language of white American men, their word choices and their choice to include and make room for differently abled people and voices um, is meaningful, even though it might not seem like it. Because if you have more and more people making thoughtful word choices or bringing, you know, bringing the light, like you said, acting as a torch, Um, and lighting up different pathways, that's how you illuminate and that's how you effect change, right? And I kind of think of that as being sort of a quiet advocacy um, where you're sort of just bringing that perspective or that, that, that new way of looking. And if you get enough people, you know, where you're, you're spreading that it, it, you start to see things shift and move. And even though we've had so much, you know, such a tumultuous time with the pandemic and our politics. Um, I do feel like 2019, uh, you know, you specifically mentioned that year, for some reason, it does feel like the climate right now is shifting. Um, and I think that's really good, you know, for, for many, many, many reasons. Um, sure. Absolutely. Um, I was actually waiting for you to say the word enlightenment. So I'm like, she's going to say it. I'm like, no, she didn't. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, how I like to think about it, like enlightening others about those kinds of experiences. Yeah, because I have found yeah. that people often, I, I, I almost, I hate to say it's human nature, but perhaps it is that we just don't really think about things that don't affect our lived experience. Um, and we don't, we don't need to, if no one ever, you know, asks us to, if no one ever asks us to self-examine, um, we don't. Um, so, um, yeah, illuminating and enlightening is important. It's important work. Uh, and you do yeah. that on the fobo- on the phoblographer, um, I think. And um, I'd really like to hear how you 
got the idea for that? And how, I mean, did you envision it being such a, a broad, expansive um, thing when you got into it? Or has it just grown? Um, my original vision for the site was to find a way to cut through the noise. And that's, that vision has had to evolve over, we turned 12 in December. Um, we're in our 13th year. It's had to evolve over the years. So back then, I was mostly focusing on the tech world because there were so many ways that like photography wasn't necessarily attainable to everyone else. Um, it was made into like this kind of like exclusive club and it was very hoity-toity. But then I started to talk about photography in different ways that were more attainable to newbies and anyone that was casually into it. And that's how we started to break through everything, um, so to speak. That started with our reviews. Um, and then I brought that to uh, our art team. Um, and our art team really does try to do that as well, too. Um, it's led by uh, Dan Jin, um, who's been with us for, I think, around five years now. Um, the managing editor at Feature Shoot, Ellen Kale, she's also part of our team. And uh, Faraz Khan is also part of our team. Faraz is based in Dubai. Ellen's based here in New York. Dan is based uh, wherever the hell he picks in the world at the moment, quite honestly. Uh, he's one of those I people. was watching one of his um, interviews, uh, and he was in Mexico. <laughs> Yeah, um, he has been in Mexico for a lot of time, but then he was also in Ecuador for a while, and now I think he's back in the UK, um, and he's going to come back soon. Um, he kind of wants to come back to New York because he was here for a while and he loved it. Um, but yeah, I've always really been big about, one, diversity, and obviously when you look at that team, it is pretty diverse. And then in addition to that too, bringing that more to the reviews world has really been a big thing that I've been focusing on in the past couple of years. Um, I handle reviews. Hilary Gregonis is our reviews editor. Um, Brittany Smith is our lead reviewer. And then um, Faraz, our photo editor, actually also takes on certain reviews because he has that kind of skill set. So um, when you look at the review world in the publication, um, in the publication sort of lens, uh, there aren't too many female-led teams, and there aren't too many teams that actually bring the perspective of a woman. Um, there's quite a lot of YouTubers out mm -hmm. there, um, but I mean, the way I've, I've talked about it for a while, like there are authentic YouTubers out there, don't get me wrong, but I don't really think a lot of them have what a publication can do. Um, and I've seen that a lot of times in comments and emails and all that kind of stuff where like they go through things a little bit more thoroughly and they really sort of deliver a completely different perspective than someone might um, just because of the way that Google SEO versus like YouTube SEO mm -hmm. works. Um, hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Is there a direction that you're hoping to take uh, the blog into or, or the website, I should say, the business? Um, there are a couple directions. One that I can really talk about right now is, um, our app. So we spent a year building the app. Um, so we started it in February last year. Yeah, we literally started it a year wow. ago. Um, and we released it, um, I would even admit a little bit prematurely back in December of last year. And we're trying to get more of our audience to move there. So one of the big complaints that we have is uh, we have a lot of ads on our mm. site. And the reason why I do that is because I pay, I believe in paying fair, livable wages. Um, a couple other websites, um, I'm not going to necessarily mention them, but you could probably figure them out, don't pay those fair, sustainable wages. But um, I really care about it. Um, so we make sure that we can pay those wages. And if you want no ads, you can go to our app. And for twenty four ninety nine a year, you can get all the contents of our website completely advertising. Wow. Free. Um, for transparency, I mean, sometimes I spend more than that at a bar, you know, like at a night. So it's really cheap to get all that content 
for a year in the app and we worked on building the way that it's displayed for a really long time went through many different iterations so it's honestly the best place that you can read us. yeah i'll check that out um yeah. i you know not being a photographer or having any background in photography um, when I was looking at your site, I did find it difficult. The, the, first of all, there's so much information on there. And I was like, whoa, I felt like a kid in a candy store. Like, where do I look first, you know? Um, but so it's really interesting to hear that you can go uh, to the app and get the same content. And twenty four ninety nine for the year, is that seems amazing. Um, I feel like, I mean, you're right. You, you go out to a meal or go out for a drink and it's easy to spend that. Yeah, totally. Um, we're also working on like a desktop redesign. We've been working on one for a while. Um, the mobile redesign, uh, we're taking our time on that. Um, but the desktop redesign is something we've been meaning to do for a while. Uh, yeah, but otherwise, I mean, full speed ahead of the, with the app. Yeah. Um, other things that we're th thinking about doing that I can talk about. Um, we've been planning to have our own sort of photo contest for a really long time. Oh, yeah. And... You know, when you look at the space of photo contests out there, a lot of photographers don't necessarily think that they get a lot out of it. So we're trying to find the right partners for it. But also something that really, really resonates with us and our audience is the idea of not Photoshopping at all. Um, it adds to authenticity. Yeah. It means that a photographer is really just trying to create as much as they can in camera with little post-production. You know, you look at some photos on like Reddit or Instagram or something like that. And people say it's a photograph, but it's actually like a photo composite with a million different layers yeah. that was created in Photoshop. And the two are not the same, right? So an idea that we have is we actually want to launch a no Photoshop contest where uh, we invite people all around the world, different ages um, to submit to this contest. We feature the photographers. We're going to have prizes, all that kind of stuff. So we're probably going to launch that this year. I wanted to launch it last year, but the app took priority. So, yeah, that's something that uh, you guys can look out for probably this year. Um, that's a really cool idea. And I noticed um, I read your most recent um, review of a lens for wildlife photography, and you had some really neat examples in there of, um, I believe, you showed Photoshopped and not Photoshopped and showed the the blurring of the edges to sort of give full transparency on how the lens itself, you know, functioned um, without the editing help. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, it's, um, it's really important because, I mean, years ago, a lot of reviewers used to not show any post-production, but the truth is that a lot of photographers do add post-production to their images but then when you go on youtube or something like that you're probably just seeing like heavily edited heavily filtered photos so we try to show people the transparency of like this is what you get this is what's possible mm, yeah that seems useful yeah i think it's really important yeah um one aspect of the photo blog oh i'm really having a hard time saying the name of your website i'm so sorry for blogger i believe in you you can do it yeah um, was your inside the photographer's mind um, column, for lack of a, a better way to think of it, um, or inter podcast. interview series, podcast, yeah. Um, yeah. Where did that come from? Was that just, you know, how did that spark? So it originally started pre-pandemic. Um, that was a collaboration between us and Adorama where we were doing this interview series at the Adorama event space. Um, and there were different photographers. We used to do it, I think it was bi-weekly or weekly or something like that. And they would come in and I would talk to them uh, about various, various different things with their photography. So my idea with our interviews, and one of the taglines for our site for a while was the psychology of photography. Mm -hmm. um, because believe it or not, a lot of people don't realize this, but most of our traffic actually comes from our interviews and our art uh, type posts. Um, but continual traffic comes in from our reviews and stuff like that and our tutorials. But anyway, it was really just about trying to find a way to talk about how and why we create. Like, for example, a photographer that does a conceptual series um, might have certain motivations. They might be trying to express, like, pain or 
being in love or some sort of other emotional aspect of it. So we try to put, we try to match emotions with artistic intent with tech mm -hmm. in our interviews and the interviews that we publish on the site. And I tried to do that in an IRL sort of situation where we talk to photographers about that. Um, and then we sometimes break it down by different series or like uh, what sort of influenced them and how they're like growing as a creative. And then we, we killed it around the pandemic time. Dan brought it back uh, last year and um, he's basically been doing his own thing with it. Um, basically, yes, talking to photographers about how and why they create and their psychology and philosophies and all that stuff. But also sometimes he brings on certain staffers. I've been on, Brittany's been on, talk a little bit about gear and like mix it up a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, so it's mostly about like talking about how and why someone creates. Because if you look at the space of like the BJP and uh, Artsy and um, It's Nice That and all those other places where you read about photography, they're not necessarily getting into the emotional aspect of how and why we create. Um, but I try to have our interviews reach out to different audiences because there's a whole tech audience that like really cares about obviously the tech but also wants to know about how people are using it. But then there are also people that care about the emotional aspect of how something is created. And there are folks that actually really just love staring at images. Um, so yeah, that's that's really where we're going with uh, Inside the Photographer's Mind. Yeah. Um, I found the, the ones that I watched, the interviews that I watched, um, just incredibly fascinating. Um, it's always interesting, any artist or any creative person to me, as a writer, it's always very interesting to hear a little bit about, you know, their vision. Um, you know, I think people who are creative and who put their work out for other people then to digest, right? Because once we release it, it's not really ours anymore. Um, it's always interesting to me to hear what their original creative vantage point was. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, I wonder, is Dan or, or has he, I have, I don't think I've watched any of the more recent ones, um, going to sort of explore with the folks he interviews, how the pandemic shaped their interaction with their art? He's talked about it a little bit with certain artists in different videos. Yeah. Um, but we also explore that in our like text based interviews as well, too. It's one of the questions that we do ask a mm -hmm. lot of folks and some people, um, a lot of the interviews that we've slotted up for women's history month actually talk about that. Some folks, they really hunkered down and they got super creative in like their own studio, photographing things like flowers or animals or something like that. Other folks decided to go out there in nature and like photograph animals or wildlife or whatever they wanted. Um, and yeah, I mean, the pandemic has changed a lot of folks creatively. Like, uh, and there's so many different aspects of that. There's one, how the area that you're living in has handled the pandemic to your type of personality, like whether you're an introvert, whether you're an extrovert sure. and, um, various other different types of factors. We interviewed a photographer that uh, talked about how he was photographing different community gardens around England because during, during yeah. that time, obviously- During pardon? the pandemic? Yeah, during the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, thank you for clarifying. Um, talking about how, you know, people went outside and they went to these community gardens and they were social distancing and documenting the sort of work that they've done there. Um, but otherwise, I mean, every other artist that we've talked to is different. Some people, they completely shut down or, and they get depressed. And yeah. some of them try to find ways to channel that depression into art. Some of them get more creative. Um, it really just depends on their personality. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I would say that was the same in the writing community. You know, some folks were prolific. Um, while others were like, I can't do this, you know, under these circumstances. And of course, many people's lives 
changed in other ways, you know, people who had children or were caring for um, maybe parents or, you know, other members of their family, um, you know, suddenly your, your time and your space is not your own anymore during the pandemic. And um, it wasn't just about, you know, am I going to get sick if I leave this space, but it was about, you know, what are my new responsibilities under this set of, you know, circumstances that we're powering through. So yeah, I can see um, that being, you know, really similar. Yeah, personally speaking, um, my space really did become more of my own. Um, I moved to another apartment, a bigger apartment. Um, and I mean, I've lived alone for a while now. Um, and not having to like, go to in person meetings, go to press trips, go to these gallery uh, things. I felt like I got a lot more of my time back and I was able to focus more as both a creative and then also more on my own business and more on myself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as I was saying, like it all varies depending on like the situation that someone's yeah. in. Yeah. Did you find yourself digging into any specific element of your creative practice um, in particular? Multiple exposures. Mm. Um, those are things that I've been doing a lot and uh, with every camera that I test, I try to do them myself. I don't always show them on our site because, uh, a lot of people look at them and they either think that like a glitch happened or they don't understand how to do it in camera. So I can't alienate our audience, right? Um, they know how to do it in Photoshop, yeah. but in camera is a totally different thing. So I worked on doing a lot of like in-person multiple exposures, but also trying to work with motion a little bit more. I don't necessarily mean video. I mean, like, someone cooking, right? And you slow down the shutter speed a lot to show that they're, like, drifting apart. And they look like a ghost moving around a kitchen mm. or something like that. Um, but then also just, like, in-camera paintings. I believe in this whole idea of just, like, looking at landscapes and then just, like, taking the camera and just going like this and creating like this really nice blur effect. Got those um, on your on your personal site, I believe. Yeah, yeah, those were cool. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um so I really work on those kinds of things and the reason why I express myself that way is because I'm actually legally blind. Oh. And through our interviews, we've actually uh featured a whole bunch of different photographers who are legally blind or visually impaired in some way. And it's you know, it's one of those things that I also work to champion really hard that you know um, photography is about sight, but some of us that are legally blind, we tend to live in multiple worlds, so we interpret things differently. Um, and I guess, like, uh, I, I'm trying to, one, push myself more as a creative in those genres that I just talked about, but I also want to work to uplift other photographers, um, kind of like what we're talking about totally throughout this interview. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's really, um, mind opening for me because I, I would imagine, um, just that if you had a vision issue that photography would be something closed off to you. So that is really intriguing to me to hear that, um, you know, there's a whole community of folks who are doing that work, um, successfully and creatively. Um, you know, it's like one of those assumptions I think that we can just too easily make that things are off limits, yeah. right? Because your X, your Y, or your Z. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. Yeah, there are lots of folks who are colorblind. There are lots of folks that have some sort of issue. Like I have a thing called keratoconus, um, which is a really extreme astigmatism. Um, and there are people I know that only have like one good working eye. Like it varies, right? It's a spectrum. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, let's see if I have any other questions written down here um, that I didn't get to ask you. Oh, one that I don't have written down, but I was thinking about earlier was um, you mentioned the variety of geographic locations from which your staff uh, pulls. And I'm curious if you know, which I'm, I'm guessing you probably do, uh, where a lot of your website traffic comes from. Do you have a, an area of the world that is more engaged with the photographer or not really, or, or is everyone sort of smattered around? Um, the U S if I had to pick one specific country, um, 
and that's consistently throughout the years. But the U.S. versus the rest of the world, the rest of the world wins. Um, mostly English-speaking countries, and it also varies depending on, like, the season. Um, something I've talked about with our staff is, like, if we have staff in, say, the Philippines or Germany, uh, our audience suddenly in those areas will end up, like, boosting. Mm -hmm. um, or if we interview, like, a lot of photographers from India or... Uh, I don't know, Bhutan or something like that, our audience will end up growing in those regions. Um, right now, our staff are based... I'm based here in Amer in New York. Ellen's based in New York. Uh, Brittany's based in Montana. You're putting me on the spot here. Holy crap. Um, well, you mentioned Dubai, and you mentioned uh, Dan's in the UK or wherever he is. Yeah, I'm trying to remember everyone now. Um, Hillary's based in Michigan. Uh, Dan is either Mexico sometimes or somewhere else in South America. Right now he's in the UK. Um, I think he's actually in the Balkans right now as we speak. I'm not even sure. Um, Faraz is in Dubai. Mark, our copy editor, is in Shanghai. Um, we've had staff in South Africa before, in the Philippines... Um, in other places in America, in Canada, in Germany, yeah. Barcelona, um, a whole bunch of different places, yeah. California. Yeah. How do you, um, how do you figure out who you want to interview? I mean, who do you go after for your interviews? Like, do, are these people like known to you in the community, friends with this guy, or this guy's doing a particular type of work or this, you know, non-binary photographer is, you know, doing something unique or different, or maybe not. Um, how do you, how do you decide who you're going to interview? Um, there are a couple different ways. Um, sometimes if I just want to get out of my apartment, I'll go to a bar, have a drink by myself and I'll go through different apps. Um, one of the apps that I do go on often is Tumblr. Mm. Um, and that's where I find a lot of different photographers. I have, like, certain hashtags that I follow, like, conceptual and, like, landscape and photojournalism and portrait and all that kind of stuff. And you'll you'll get fed all these different filters, and some people try to go into those filters and do whatever they want. Um, so you have to find ways to weed them out and to curate them over mm -hmm. time. Um, so that's one way that we find photographers. Another way that we find photographers is Behance. Um, you ever heard no, of Behance? No, I have not. Behance is this platform. I honestly think it's the best thing Adobe does, even above Creative Cloud. Um, they create a community for photographers and other artists to showcase their work, collaborate with other artists, and then also find, like, gigs. Oh, interesting. Um, and you can... Their keywording is pretty good. They use some AI keywording that, personally, I think is kind of crap. Um, but otherwise, like, uh, their categories are very good. So you can follow by, like, photojournalism, by the recommended, by what's popular in the community, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. That's one place we go to. Um, I'm not comfortable talking about our other sources, partially because it gives us a competitive edge. Sure. Um and yeah, usually what I end up seeing is when we interview a photographer, sometimes other publications go ahead and they interview them later on. Uh, that's how I go about it. My other, my staff does the same thing in certain ways, but they also have some of their own different places where they go. Sure. Um, we get pitched a ton of times mm. each different day as well, yeah. too. So we'll talk about it amongst our arts team. Um, there are ways people get, can submit to certain series on our website. Like there's a, my favorite camera one. There's a no Photoshop series. There's photo essays where people can literally showcase their own projects and then talk about them. Um, there are these other template question things that people can submit. Um, yeah, I, if I were to sit here and think about it. I think most of the content that you see on the website, um, it's a combination of stuff that I find on, in these apps. Um, and I put them in like our Trello database and then our staff can pick whatever they mm -hmm. want. Um, they make their own pitches as well too. And 
Dan will improve them. It used to be me and Dan. Now I just let Dan have autonomy, more or less. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that's mostly about it. As I said, we also get a hell of a lot of yeah, pitches. Yeah, that's a pretty solid pipeline. This. Yeah, it helps um, when, you know, you have such a global audience. Um, and, I mean, you do so many different calls for, you know, a photographer doing this or that or something else like that. Um, and in our interviews, too, we also try to prompt people that, like, if they're reading it and they have a project that they want to submit, they can do it. And we show them the links on how to do that and all that kind of stuff. So um, this is a total naive person question, but um, what's the advantage uh, for a photographer in being elevated through uh, the Fablographer website? I am so happy you asked that because sometimes our staff has wondered the same thing and I bring their attention to certain emails and messages and comments and all those kinds of things. I'm going to take, for example, um, a photographer who we've helped elevate a long time ago. Her name is Ingrid uh, Alice Ersigler. I'm probably butchering her last name. Um, she's a conceptual fashion editorial photographer based in South Africa. And when we found her work on Behance years ago, I want to say almost a decade, Megan, um, a lot of folks were able to see her work and she got hired a hell of a lot more. She got a lot more traction in different ways. Her creativity grew. Um, the people that wanted to collaborate with her increased a whole lot. Um, so, you know, some people say you're working for exposure, but for us, like, we have the audience that are genuinely interested in these kinds of pieces. Right. Um, there are a bunch of other stories that we've had over the past couple of years. I'm just trying to remember all of them. Um, there was this point years ago where I would actually print out a lot of them and I would surround my office in these emails where people are saying thank you. And any time that I would sit there thinking that I was overwhelmed by all the work that I had, I literally just look around the office and I'd see all these different emails that said thank you for the way that you helped me in my career. And when I looked at those emails, I thought about each one of those people. And those emails and physically just looking at, you know, the printouts helped me get through some of my toughest times leading this site. Um, so yeah, like some folks, like they get discovered by X company, you know, I'm saying X company because it could be any other company yeah. and they get hired in different ways or people look at them and they want to collaborate with them in various different ways. Um, yeah, it's mostly about, networking i would say and uh getting more gigs that's what's happened with a lot of our audience um and a lot of the folks who read our site uh part of that comes from our seo benefits um even if i were to leave the blogger tomorrow i'm still an seo hacker mm. um so being able to search for the pho photographers and all these different things like if i type in megan Riley, Riley, the am i saying riley, riley. Riley, thank you. If I typed in your name into Google and let's say we interviewed you, we'd come up as one of the top results mm -hmm. um, because we have such pull with Google search engines. Um, and then in addition to that too, I mean, just like we have different ways that we feature photographers and uh, people come to us. Like for example, Flipboard, uh, a really popular app for getting news. We're the largest photo publication on mm -hmm. there. So when people discover new photographers that they're really, really interested in, uh, they follow them on Instagram or they interact with them or they reach out to them via their website. Yeah. Um, they get gigs, all those kinds of things. So, yeah, um, those are some tangible ways. I'm, I, you know, I'm saying this right now and uh, I'm forgetting uh, one of my good friends, Brooke Di Donato. I hope you've heard of her, um, a famous photographer. I'm looking quite literally at a print of hers behind my computer monitor and behind the Sony camera that I'm recording on right now. And um, I'm thinking like, I interviewed her when she won years ago, it was a PDN award of some sort and we featured her a couple times. I know that that's helped her build her career a lot more. And now I look at her and I'm like, man, this girl is doing like great work. I'm so proud of her. She was just in Photografiska. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like we're a stepping stone for people. Um, it helps build their careers and helps build their work. Um, 
it's just also the folks need to sometimes remember that like uh you have to sort of promote all the work that you do like some photographers that we talk to they're like oh yeah i was featured here on petavixel and here on f-stoppers and here on the guardian you know um so you just have to like kind of show that to other people i think Hard and, for uh, creatives, right? I mean, I, I think, I mean, part of it is depends on what kind of person you are, right? But um, generally, you know, you can be a very creative person, but not be well versed in how to sell yourself, right? How to promote yourself. Yeah, and I think that that's sometimes a really tough thing. Yeah. Like, quite, quite candidly, there are some terrible photographers that know how to sell themselves very well. And there are some <laughs> fantastic photographers that don't have the single clue of how to talk to someone, right. unfortunately. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do photographers also suffer from imposter syndrome like writers do? <laughs> I think yeah. so. Yeah. Um, when you were talking earlier about um, putting emails up around, you know, your office, uh, I really think that's, that's what we want to refer to as being the light, Chris. That's being the torch for other people. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that we're so wired to not give us our, ourselves enough credit. And I mean, I'm also one of those people. I'm trying to fight that. I'm trying to find ways to actually find ways to, you know, give myself just a little bit more credit. Um, I've had people that have wanted to do that. And I'm just like, yeah, but if I, I feel sometimes that if I take too much credit, I'll let it go to my head and I won't keep trying. So I'm trying to find a way to balance that out. And um, printing those emails was one of those ways. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of other folks, like photographers, they could find ways to, you know, show tangible benefits of, like, what they've accomplished. Yeah. And some do, right? You Like, you go to their website and you'll see, like, a press section and you'll see tear sheets and stuff like that. Um, but it's different between... Uh, there's a huge difference between seeing that on your website all the time and going into your studio and being surrounded by yeah. it, you know? Yeah. It's good to have reminders and, and it's good to be reminded why we do the things that we do. Sometimes it, you know, especially during difficult times, the pandemic comes to mind. Um, you know, it's hard to remember like, why am I doing this or, or what are my goals, you know, moving forward? Um, what would you say your goals are? Let's wrap up on that. Um, what would you say your goals are um, for, 2022 and beyond, not just with the photographer, but maybe personally with your own work or whatever you care to speak to. Personally with my own work, um, I want to try to find a way to go even further with my in-camera paintings and my multiple exposures. I want to get even better, more complicated, more mind-blowing. People will look at it and they'll be like, how the heck did he do that in-camera? Um, so I'm, I try to take, wait, I try to take my time to figure out different techniques. Um, I'll sometimes do that with the cameras that I'm testing. Um, certain cameras have better features for it. Like for example, uh, OM system lets you do this thing called live composite in camera that I used recently to create a photo of stars over New York City, which otherwise is pretty much impossible to do. Like people have composited it, but I was able to do it in camera. So try and find different ways to be more expressive that way and to do things that weren't necessarily possible or people didn't think they were possible. Mm -hmm. um, for the photographer, um, one of our big things that I can talk about is building our membership in the photographer's app. Um, I'm partnering up with a couple of companies to actually offer like discounts and freebies and all those kinds of things. Um, so I want to build a fuller membership platform for photographers. And this initiative really started when I was working at APA. Um, APA is the American Photographic Artists. And I was formerly the vice chairman over there for the New York chapter. And what I was doing there is I was bringing insurance benefits to photographers and discounts to like the Fuji Wonder Shop and Adorama and all those over there different places. And I'm, I want to do that with the blogger. Um, but I can do it in a completely different way because the blogger is a million times larger than APA. Mm -hmm. um, and APA, in some ways, I felt like I had my hands tied behind my back. 
But here with my own company, the only thing tying my hands behind my back is, one, my own limitations in ethics, and two, how far I could go with one company versus another. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to find a way to basically build a benefits platform for photographers built into our app with our content. Um, and that's really my big goal for this year. Um, I've got a couple companies signed on that really do want to do it. We just haven't launched it officially. And yeah, I, I want to find a way to build. Um, I want to, this year, we're also hiring um, a whole bunch of different positions. So I want to find a way to go deeper into the sciences. I want to find a way to go deeper into the art world in some different ways. Um, and I want to keep our staff as diverse as possible as well, too. Um, those are really big initiatives to me. I feel like you've probably seen this as well. Like, for example, the European way of approaching photography and art is totally different than the American way. Same thing with South America and Asia and all those kinds of things. And I feel like we need to find a way to incorporate all those different types of folks into our site. Mm, yeah. Do you know, I mean, do you have any idea how you're going to do that? <laughs> I mean, um, I do, but I don't really necessarily want to talk yeah, about no, that. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. Um, I'm just curious if your brain already has like a, oh, I could do this towards that goal. You're sort of already in that space. Um, I haven't really thought about it and fleshed it out that much yet. The way that I think about things is, oh my God, this is going to sound incredibly nerdy. <laughs> um, I think about things in like trilogies so if you were taking like a movie like the lord of the rings for example mm -hmm. um there's like the fellowship of the ring and all the other ones um so those are movies right and then from there you have different chapters that they're broken down to and then you have different sections and all those kinds of things i think about three big goals for any one goal that i have and then i break them down into smaller pieces mm -hmm. to get to those bigger goals yeah um, so that's what I'm trying to flesh out with what I have. I just haven't been able to take the time to do yeah. it yet. Oh, I understand that. I often think about things really peripherally, um, you know, while they're sort of manifesting, um, they're, they're simmering in the pot, so to speak, you know? Um, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Well, this has been really interesting and I thank you so much for taking time to talk with us and talk with me. Um, and your graciousness and in indulging my naivete about uh, many things photography related, but it's been really interesting hearing about your work and um, I look forward to writing this up for Space for Arts. Yeah, uh, and um, we will uh, be able to push that out whenever it is ready, but otherwise, um, folks, thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube or check us out on podcasts and uh, take a listen whenever we get a chance. and. Of course, visit the photographer. Um, if you want, download our app on iOS, Android, or iPad OS. And uh, we wish you a wonderful day.